everybody. Welcome to Calvary Online. My name is Kiana, and I have the privilege of being one of the worship leaders here at Calvary, and I'm joined with two friends and fellow worship leaders, Jamie and John. Yep, we are super pumped to be here with you. We've got a really special mini set of unplugged worship for you, including a sneak preview of a song that we're about to release in a couple weeks. We'll explain more in a second, but first, we would love to meet you. So go ahead, drop a line in the chat, tell us where you are watching from. All right, so hey, we are Calvary Music, and we exist to write songs for our church here at Calvary Chapel. And our heart and our prayer is that as we are journeying through the texts that our pastors are preaching, that we would be able to write songs to those scriptures, bring them to life a little bit, and hopefully these songs will lift your eyes to Jesus, encourage you in your day-to-day as you're driving to work or school or, or just in your house. We pray that these songs will help bring the scriptures to life. And one of those songs is called While You Wait, and we're going to give you guys a little sneak peek of it. It's based out of Matthew chapter six, where Jesus is reminding us to not worry about our life, to not be anxious about our life. If he clothes the lilies of the field and feeds the birds, how much more will he care for you and take care of you? And so here's a sneak peek of the song while you wait. If he dresses the lilies, if his eye is on the sparrow, he'll watch over you. Cause he's just that good And if your heart starts to worry When you pass through the shadows He's walking with you Cause he's just that good Yeah, he's just that good So while you wait Give him praise Cause he's a friend through every fight Our hope is in his name So while you wait, give Him praise. For the Lord is good forever, His love will never fail. Oh, cause all I have needed, You have provided. All I will ever need, you will supply it. Oh, I believe it. Oh, so while you wait, give him praise. While you wait, give him praise. While you wait, give him praise. Give him praise. So while you wait, give him praise. Cause he's a friend through every fire. Our hope is in His name, so while you wait, give Him praise. For the Lord is good forever, His love will never fail. For the Lord is good forever, His love will never fail. For the Lord is good forever, His love will never fail. power in your voice to heal every sickness. You speak a word and the wind and the waves are hushed. You cover all of our sin and breathe your forgiveness. You tell the mountains to move and the earth bows down. Just say the word, oh, I will believe what you say. Just say
spoke a word, my soul reclaimed when you spoke a word. When you speak a word, all heaven shouts. When you speak a word, your kingdom comes. When you speak a word, just say the word. Oh, I will believe what you say. Just say the word. Oh. Hey, we hope you enjoyed that. If you're just joining us, that was a little unplugged worship warm up and a sneak preview at our new song, While You Wait, that we're releasing on May 3rd. So excited. So watch for that on your favorite streaming platform. And now let's join the Fort Lauderdale campus for our service today. And then stick around afterwards for one more unplugged song with us after the message. We'll see you then. Good evening, Calvary. What a blessing it is to be together in the house of the Lord to worship Him together. If you're not already, let's stand to our feet and recognize Him for who He is. You are worthy of it all.
sun to rise You lay it down to rest You hold this heart of mine You hold my every breath Such an awesome God So
why we're here tonight to remind our souls and our minds and our hearts that you are worthy you are worthy of every breath you are worthy of our attention you are worthy of our adoration our worship it all belongs to you because you've given us new life it's your breath inside of our lungs it's your mercies that are new every morning and we get to rest and enjoy it as your kids no longer striving no longer working, but rather just resting in the love of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just tell him thank you tonight? Thank you, Jesus. And God, because you are worthy, Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word being preached. Would it transform us from the inside out? We ask for a move of God, something only you can do. Draw people to yourself tonight. It is in Jesus' matchless name we pray and ask all these things. Calvary Chapel, we said? Amen. 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 Good evening, Calvary. Happy Saturday night. How's everyone doing tonight? Hey, we'd like to welcome all of our campuses and those joining us in our online community. We are grateful that you're here. We are one church in many locations all across South Florida, and we want you to know that if you're, if you're new here and you're like, man, this is a big church, or I'm looking at a screen right now where I don't know how all these churches are connected, uh, we would love for you to text the word new to 31352, and that's going to give you a chance to get to know what our church is all about in any of these locations across South Florida and, and really missions all around the world. And you can also, as you have your phone out, scan the QR code that's on the screen uh, behind me or the seat in front of you, and you're going to get some notes for this message and, and really on-ramps to all the incredible things that are happening around this church, ways for you to engage, ways for you to learn, uh, ways for you to grow, because uh, we are a one church in all these locations uh, serving one purpose. We have this vision to reach our community and change our world for Jesus Christ, and that's what we're all about here, and we uh, teach God's word, and we help draw people to the love of God as we've been drawn to that love love of God. So if you, if you experience the passion of these people, it's because we have been changed by Jesus. Amen? Amen. So if you have a Bible, oh, I'd love for you to open to Matthew chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand wherever you are, whatever campus you're at. We're going to provide a Bible for you. It's going to be our gift to you. Uh, we here at Calvary, we read through the Bible. So we're doing Matthew chapter 11 and then Matthew chapter 12 and next week, Matthew chapter 13. And so we keep on going through that process of reading through the Bible. That's why we ask you to bring your Bibles. That's why we ask you, if you're a guest, to take a Bible, write your name in it, make it yours, uh, because we want to be students of God's Word. And we also want to celebrate something because uh, we have uh, 10 campuses across South Florida. We're launching a new one in downtown that's, that's uh, sort of in a soft launch stage. But, but I don't know if you guys know this or not, but our Parkland campus uh, turns five years old. It's, five, it's a five-year celebration. And so I want to tell you just about seeds of faith. So five years ago, the tragedy of Stoneman Douglas, the shooting, there was a Bible study that was meeting in a little community center and then Carmelo's Coffee. And then after that, uh, West Glades Middle and then 
after that, uh, during COVID, summer nights, and then after that, a movie theater, then a hotel, and eventually they got a semi-permanent location uh, where Coconut Creek and Parkland sort of come together, but they have been uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus, and people in that community have been drawn in a beautiful, powerful way. Leaders are being developed, and we just want to celebrate with the Parkland campus five years of faithful ministry, and we look forward to the next five, and the next five, and the next five, until Jesus comes back. Now, one of the cool things about the Parkland campus is now that Calvary Espanol shares that building. So now there's two vibrant churches happening out of one location. And, and this is what we love to see. We love to see the gospel continuing to move because if the gospel is not moving, then we just look back and we celebrate the, the past. We look at a monument. But we know that the kingdom of heaven is still advancing, and we're watching God continue to build his kingdom. And so we look forward in hope uh, to the next church campus, to the next launch, to the next people who are going to be reached with the glorious gospel. And so uh, we just want to share that uh, celebration with you. And at 1 o'clock tomorrow, there's going to be a, a party and a kind of hangout time. We'd love for you to join us uh, at the Parkland campus if you would like to. And now we want to take a moment, and we want to pray and ask God to speak as only he can, as we read his word. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you that in a world of lots of noise, that you can speak in such a clear way through your word, and that your word is the truth, and that your word can not just renew our minds, but it can transform our hearts. So we invite you today, speak through your word, through your spirit, because we, your people, are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you know that, that life can be overwhelming? Anybody here, here had a rough day or a rough week or a rough month or a rough year. You think about a lot of life. You wake up and you got to get to work. You, you, have, you have bills to pay. You have a to-do list. You have all things in your to-do list that, that you haven't done yet. And then you're adding to that a mental to-do list that you're trying to figure out what to do. And then, you know, I got to study for this test or I've got to put my kids through college. I've got to fix this or that thing is broken. Oh, and today I ran over a nail and now I have a flat tire. And all these things keep adding up. And then I need to pray and I need to read the Bible and I want to be part of a group and I want to serve. And oh, my, my phone is always ringing and there's messages everywhere. And I, I can hardly take a breath. And sometimes my mind is so tired and I'm going so fast, I can't even think. Anybody? Okay. Everyone take a breath. If you've ever felt overwhelmed emotionally, mentally, you look at your schedule and one more thing will be the straw that breaks the camel's back, then you have come at the perfect time because Jesus is going to invite his followers to rest, to recover their souls, to be refreshed in the middle of all the crazy there's the beautiful invitation of Jesus. And it's just like taking a deep breath. And he's going to share this message about rest in the middle of the most important mission that the world has ever known. He's launching the mission, sending his disciples two by two to get the gospel out into all of these cities. And in the middle of this, he invites people to rest. And so Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, here's what we read. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. And all things have been committed to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So here's the invitation. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the middle of the world's most important mission, when there's things to do, when there's important things to do, Jesus 
gets his disciples and says, just, hey guys, take a minute and let's breathe. And he talks about his relationship with his father and his father's relationship with him and how he, he's wanting people to be drawn into this love relationship of father and son that, that's bringing salvation to the world. And he says, and a lot of the smartest people in the world can't figure it out, but little kids, little kids can figure this out. That there is a time to rest. And he offers this beautiful invitation. So come to me. Your soul is tired. Your mind is fatigued. That next straw that's about to break the camel's back is right there and you can hardly breathe. Jesus says, come to me. I want to I teach you something. And he uses this phrase, my yoke is easy. Now, if you're not familiar with how the farmers in the Hebrew first century sort of farmed. They, they used a yoke that looked something like this to get two oxen to plow together. Because if you're plowing a field and you don't have a tractor, you need to, to use a, an animal's power. And so this is what two oxen would look like as they are yoked together. And, and here's what a farmer would do. A farmer would take the most experienced ox, and then he would take the, the brand new, the teenage, the 20-something ox, and... And well, the older ox would teach the younger ox how to plow, not to go too fast so they go sideways or not to go too slow because he's being lazy, not to try to take control, but, but to learn to walk together because when you learn to walk together, you get a lot more work done. And, and Jesus uses this example in a way that everyone who heard it would understand. Of course, you, you have the older ox teaching the younger ox and Jesus says, I I'm your rabbi, I'm your teacher. And there's things that I'm going to do, and there's things that you're going to do that I'm not going to do for you. But I, I want to I go with you so I can teach you, because my yoke, the burden that I place on my disciples, is easy. And you're like, easy. You know, this is the only time in the Bible you'll see that word, easy. Jesus is talking about take up your cross and follow me unless you deny yourself and give up your life. You can't follow me. You're not worthy of me. And then he uses this idea of an easy yoke. Now, easy is not a circumstance word. Jesus did, didn't say to his disciples, hey, if you follow me, you're going to have an easy life. No, he said, if you follow me, trouble's going to come. So what's he talking about easy? easy? Easy is a soul word. Easy is, hey, when things are really difficult, I'm going to teach you how to carry that. When the stress and pressure and demands grow so great, you can hardly take a breath. Well, learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And now I'm going to show you how to walk into criticism and through it. I'm going to show you how to walk into persecution and false accusation. I'm going to, I'm going to have you walk through rejection. And, and if you learn from me, if you're my student, if I'm your rabbi, and you're my apprentice, then you can walk through very difficult things without getting cynical or angry or allowing your compassion to get quenched or allowing your hope to die. If you come to me, I can teach you the life of the easy yoke. How many, for how many, does that sound like a great invitation, right? I'm still trying to figure out how to do this. I've been following Jesus for 35 years. I'm like, I want to lean in because I need to figure this thing out. What a powerful invitation. When life is hard and overwhelming and things don't make sense and there's sadness and confusion and anxiety and all these things going on and Jesus is like, take a breath, come to me. You can find rest for your soul. Here's, here's this same passage in, in a more modern translation. Listen to the words that Jesus invites. Uh, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now, again, this is not Jesus saying, if you follow me, it'll be a 25-hour work week. Wake up at 10, have your cup of coffee. You won't have to work that hard. No, Jesus worked very hard. In fact, 
when he was working, when people said he shouldn't be working, he said, well, I'm always working. And my father's always been working. Even to this very day, my father is at work. So God's always at work all the time. And Jesus is reminding all those people who are following him, you're going to work hard. What he's talking about is that you can be busy, but not in a hurry. Did you ever notice all the things that Jesus did in a day? Woke up early, sometimes got home very late or not even to his own house. He was sort of homeless wherever he was staying. He, was, he had some long, long days. And Jesus was very busy, but Jesus was never in a hurry. And if you watch his life, if you're an apprentice or a disciple of Jesus and you follow his life, you're like, how can I be busy? How can I have a full schedule but not live a hurried life? And when Jesus is saying something about the idea that, that hurry is sort of toxic to our souls, that if we're hurrying, we're not going to be able to pay attention and be in a relationship with the Father that's going to help us to thrive. And the disciples are experiencing uh, this meteoric success, meaning the places they go now, the crowds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you become successful, people want to talk to you. They want to ask your advice. I mean, imagine if the disciples had cell phones back in the day. They'd be ringing like crazy, texting like crazy. I need you to meet with my father, my mother, my aunt, my uncle. I need to ask you a question. I have a business idea. I, all, the, all the things, right? And the more you achieve and the more successful you are in life, the more people want a piece of you, a piece of your time. And some of you that are chasing success, you don't know this yet, but some of you that have succeeded in a way you never imagined are like, I can't turn it off. I can't stop it. It's sort of consuming me. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, hey, the most important thing in, in, in life is not what you achieve or what you accomplish. It's not what you do. It's who you become. Your soul matters to God. So pay attention to your soul. I remember uh, reading a conversation between a, a pastor and another pastor, and this, this pastor had become sort of famous. He'd written some books and and. He was being asked to speak all these places, and he, he goes to this older pastor who's like a sage, and he's like, you know, I feel like I'm growing on the outside. I'm writing books. I'm, I'm traveling all over. I'm speaking. Everyone wants to talk to me, but I, I feel like my inside hasn't grown. And this mentor of him said, make sure in life that your inside is always bigger than your outside. And that's an important word. Make sure if you're following Jesus no matter how much is happening on the outside, how much activity, how much achievement, how success, that the inside of you is growing as fast or more rapidly than your outside. Otherwise, there's going to be this, this disconnect. And that's why one of the most sobering cautions in all of the Bible is Proverbs 4.23. Solomon wrote this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Jesus is telling his disciples, pay attention to your soul. Solomon's saying, the most important thing is, is what's coming out of here, your, your soul, your heart, your thoughts, your emotions, your will, the things that drive you, the things you desire. Those things are constantly pushing you toward something and you want to pay attention. I was having a, a phone call with a, a pretty successful leader in the last couple of weeks and this leader, um, he basically said, you know, I've, I've got all this business things going really well and all these social engagements I have to go to, and I've got my family, and I've got, I've got you know, my own recreation, and I've got all these things, and I feel like I'm going so fast that my body hasn't caught up with my soul. And I thought, what an interesting comment. And it reminded me of a story of a woman who traveled to Africa to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and she was like, you know, from the U.S., and she was an achiever. She was a driver, and she, she, she had this pace with her guides to go, hey, we're going to travel more than the recommended uh, distance the first day. And so they, they sort of outpaced their expectation the first day. And the, the next day, she woke up early, and she got her guides and porters ready. Let's go. We can, we can maybe get up here in half the time. And, and the porters wouldn't move. And she's talking to the guides here, like, like, what's up? We have a chance to get up there, right, like, early. Let's go. And they said, you know, we traveled too far, too fast yesterday. And so we're going to sit and wait for our souls to catch up to our bodies. Huh. In her Western mind, that made no sense at all. In your Western mind, you drive, you achieve, you break the record, you go. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, slow down. 
breathe. Pay attention to what's going on inside you because who you are is way more important than what you do. And who you're becoming is way more important than what you achieve. Come to me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me and you can find rest, rest for your souls. I want, I want everyone here to say the word rest. rest. Uh, some of you are smiling like, oh man, I want to rest so bad. Some of you are just physically tired because you're not sleeping much. Some of you, you're, you're, you're emotionally spent because you've poured out so much emotion. Some of you, are, you're mentally so fatigued and tired from all the decisions you have to make. And Jesus is saying, if you come to me, I can teach you how to find a rest for your souls. No matter how busy you are on the outside. Well, you can find this grace on the inside. So I want us to think for a minute. If you were your best self, if your soul was healthy and rested, it wasn't so depleted. How would you feel? What would it be like to be around you? Well, you might say, man, when I'm at peace in my soul and I'm not going too fast, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm hopeful. I'm patient. Uh, I'm kind. I, I have self-control. I and you start to think about all the things that people will say when I'm, I'm more creative when I'm rested. I'm, I'm, I'm more loving and compassionate. All of this, this fruit of God's spirit in our lives comes out of a soul that, that's rested, that's connected with God and connected with other people. Now, if I ask the opposite question, how do you know your soul is depleted? That you've gone so fast, so far, and you don't even know how to feel or think about where you're at. Well, maybe you feel anxious. You get critical. Those really little things become big things. You feel anger. You feel a sense of depression. What's it worth? I don't know if I can do this anymore. If you just ask that question, man, my soul is healthy. Here's what I'm thinking and feeling. When my soul is depleted, here's what I'm thinking and feeling. Then we would get this, this powerful, like, draw to go, if, if, if this is what Jesus is saying and it's true for all of us and he can teach us how to do this, then, then I, want, I want in. And so Jesus is inviting not just his disciples 2,000 years ago, but for us that we can find this easy yoke if we learn from him. Now, in chapter 12, we're gonna, we're gonna see this idea of Sabbath because Jesus is in this constant kind of friction and conversation with the Pharisees and religious leaders about this day of rest, this Sabbath day. And so let's see what happens right after his teaching on rest. Matthew 12, 1, at the time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And he answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath day, a duty in the temple, desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All right, there's a lot going on here. So the disciples are walking along on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday for uh, the, the, the Jewish people, and they're walking along and they're picking grain. Now, first of all, you think, are the disciples stealing grain out of someone else's field? Because that's what's happening. They're walking through someone else's field and picking the grain and eating it. This is not stealing because the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 25 says, if you're walking through your neighbor's field and you're hungry, you can pluck the kernels of grain and eat them as you go. Just don't get a sickle and start harvesting their field for them, right? That's, that's written in the law. And so you know that the disciples are poor, that they're dependent on the hospitality of strangers. And so they're going through the Sabbath. There's nothing to eat. So all they do is pluck the grain and eat it. Doesn't sound very appetizing, but this is how they find nourishment. And so the problem is not that they're eating grain. The problem is that they have plucked the grain and they put it in their mouth, and the Pharisees said, you have violated Sabbath. So first of all, what is Sabbath? 
Anybody heard of the Big Ten, the Big Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20? Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it. Six days you will work and one day you will. Because God made the world in six days on the seventh day he. And so he set this day aside and he has made it holy. This is a big law. It's like it's got a long description of the Ten Commandments. It's got the long, longest description of all of them. And so Sabbath's important. But then the religious leaders, the rabbis at the time were like, well, what is work? We, we got to figure out what work is. And so they created like 40 categories of work and 40 violations within those categories that would con constitute as work. And they would, they would give these additional laws, not laws in the Bible, laws on their commentaries that they would impose them on people. So I'm going to tell you sort of how ridiculous this is. It's not just you're not allowed to pick grain and eat it. That, that's considered work. Listen, here's two. So you're not allowed to carry things on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to carry them in your hands or across your chest or on the back of your shoulders. But you can carry something on the back of your hand or in your elbow or in your shoe. I don't know who came up with that, but that sounds crazy. Or this is even better. All right, so a woman is allowed to tie a knot in her girdle but she's not allowed to pull water from a bucket to get water from the well. But if she ties the, the knot of her girdle to the rope, she can use the girdle to hold the rope to pull up the water and get a drink. And that was actually one of the regulations in the first century. And Jesus is like, this is crazy. We're, we're walking through the field. We're hungry. We're eating food because we're hungry. Because, well, the man... Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And, and, and Jesus, I, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I, I created Sabbath. I know what it was about. And so we're going to eat grain no matter what you say, because you don't know what you're talking about. And so we're going to watch Jesus get confrontational around, around people who are talking about rest in a way that wasn't restful at all. And so he asked them two questions in verse three and verse five. Haven't you read? Now, this is Jesus' way to talk trash. Because these people were scribes and Pharisees. That's all they did was read the law. So he's pushing back to them. Haven't you read? Like, this is your full-time job. Don't you know that David, when he was hungry, went into the temple and ate the, the consecrated bread because it was an act of survival and God didn't punish him? Or how about this? Haven't you read that, that the, the priests who work in the temple on Sabbath slaughtering animals and burning incense and carrying things and lifting them up on the altar, that they violate the Sabbath every single day, and yet they're innocent? I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I work every Sunday. <laughs> I work every Saturday night. Am I violating Sabbath? No, I celebrate Sabbath on Monday. Anyway, <laughs> listen, listen. Jesus is making a, a, a point to, to point out the hypocrisy of what they're saying. He's like, you guys are so obsessed about someone breaking the law. You're working so hard on Sabbath to make sure no one else works hard on Sabbath. Don't you see the irony of that? In fact, they're going to get so upset with Jesus, they're going to plot how they can kill him on the Sabbath. And that irony is coming in a minute. But he says... Haven't you read, and then, and then verse 7, he's quoting Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the rest of that verse says, an acknowledgement of God and his sovereign power and not offerings of lambs and goats. And so Jesus is reteaching them because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so he's going to deliberately break their additions to show that the Sabbath was always meant to be a gift and never a burden. And so as we think about Sabbath as New Testament Christians, well, what can we learn? Well, there's two, two ways we can err when it comes to Sabbath. The first is we can build all these legalistic laws around the Sabbath. Here's what you can do, and here's what you can't do, and here's when it should be, and here's when it can't be, and, and we can build this whole thing, and we can go on the great adventure of missing the point, which is what all of these religious leaders did. One of the biggest issues they fought with Jesus about is the regulations of Sabbath. But we can also fall into error by neglecting the idea of Sabbath. 
as Christians saying, well, that's an Old Testament law, and Jesus came to bring a new covenant and a new law, so I'm not bound by Sabbath. And that would also be a mistake. You see, Sabbath resting one day of the week is sort of like the same as giving, generosity, the tithe for Christians. Both of these things were written in the law of Moses, but the idea of giving to God your first tenth and the idea of resting that one day of week, those were both laws or ideas that God presented way before the law ever existed. I mean, Genesis chapter two, right? God rested from all his work and he said, it is very good. And now all of us get this invitation. This is not because God is tired, right? So God creates everything. He says it's very good. It's like God is sitting on his throne and he's looking and reigning over the earth and he's saying, this is what I created. And it is very, very good. He's reflecting on the goodness of creation. And he invites us, come reflect with me on the goodness of creation. And, and for some people, this idea of working six days and taking one off, it sort of sounds crazy. I mean, there's this company, they, they cook God's chicken. It's called Chick-fil-A, you ever heard of it? <laughs> and the founder has this crazy idea that we're gonna keep our fast food restaurant open six days a week and we're gonna close it on one of the busiest days to sell chicken. And people look at the Kathy family and thought, they're, they're crazy. That's the stupidest business model that you could ever have. And yet, somehow God has honored that and they're one of the most successful food companies in the United States of America because they took the principle of God so seriously and said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna work six days and we're gonna rest one and we're gonna trust God because it takes, it takes trust not to work. You realize that, right? Because you have to, you're, on the, you're on the grind. You've got to make it happen. You've got to pay the bills. And it takes trust to go, you know what? One day of the week, I'm just going to trust that God is going to provide. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I'm not going to get on that rat wheel and run like crazy because he is good, right? In the same way, it takes faith to give God your first 10% and say, God, I give you this first. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, but I'm just going to trust you. And that type of faith, that type of worship, it honors God. It brings a smile to his faith. And so, so we want to be the people of God who say, how do I honor the idea of Sabbath? If I'm resting, I'm trusting. And this is what we're invited to. Now, the people of Israel were invited all through the centuries to, to rest in God. And, and here's one of those moments where the, God invites them to rest, the book of Isaiah. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. So God's saying, your strength is not in how hard you work and how much good you do. Your strength, the, the, mo the, the most strength you'll ever find is just to rest in God's salvation, to rest in God's power, to rest in God's provision, and in quietness and in repentance. God, I failed again, but you are still good. You live and walk by faith. And you know the people's response? Well, here's what God says. I, I told you you could rest in, in quietness and find strength and salvation. And he says, but you would have none of it. There's this human resistance that says, no, I, I gotta make it happen. That whole idea of praying God's gonna provide. I, I love that on Sundays, but I gotta grind, grind, grind. I gotta work seven days a week. I can't take a break. And and if you're living this way, you're not just violating one of the Ten Commandments. You're violating the, this law of the universe. God weaved Sabbath into all of creation. Everything around you that's in the natural world needs rest. And if you blow past all of those God-given parameters, well, you, you will suffer. And you, you find yourself in this place of, I don't know what I think and how to feel. And so, so Jesus is saying, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Just learn from me and listen to me. And so now in verse nine, he's going to go into a place, into the synagogue, and he's going to have this sort of showdown with the Pharisees. It says, going on from this place, he went to the, their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. 
So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Jesus knows they're setting a trap for him, and this is one of the times he takes the bait. He goes into the synagogue. They're all there watching him, and there's a man with a shriveled hand, and and so now they're having this dialogue back and forth. Are you allowed to heal someone or do something good on the Sabbath? And Jesus is just like, I'm just going to go for it. Hey, stand up. This guy had to stand up in front of everybody. He holds out his hand. I mean, this guy's probably really nervous because he's already a sort of a social outcast. And now he's standing with his withered hand. And, and Jesus is going to make an example out of him. And he tells him to stretch out his hand. And he looks at the guys and says, if you would drag your sheep out of a pit, how much more valuable is this guy? And he heals them right in front of everybody. And they get so mad that they start thinking, how are we going to kill this guy? And that's how religious people can sometimes get. You're, you get so lost in the weeds of what you think the Bible says in the box you created that you could actually justify killing a righteous man because he violated your legal list. And this is exactly what the people do. Again, they missed his point. He quoted Hosea 6.6, 6, God desires mercy more than he desires sacrifice. And now he's going to go on a riff and he's going to basically quote the prophet Isaiah about what Messiah would do when Messiah would come. Verse 15, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place and a large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill and he warned them not to tell others about him. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my chosen servant who I've chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out and no one will hear his voice in the streets and a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. And in his name, the nations will put their hope. This is a powerful, powerful picture of who Messiah would be when he would come. He's a Messiah who would understand what it means to be Lord of the Sabbath. He'd be a Messiah who would heal people no matter what day of the week it was. And he was a Messiah who was so gentle. If you were a bruised reed, he wouldn't break you. If you were a smoldering wick, you know how you get the candle and the candle's just about to fizzle out? Jesus would never be the Messiah that would go, you're done. No, no. If there's just a little flame left in your life, he's going to, He's going to cultivate it, protect it. He's so gentle with us in those moments where we're in pain, in confusion, in loss. We don't know what to think. We don't know what to feel. And all of these prophecies from Isaiah speak to what Jesus is doing in this very moment. And so how do we take what Matthew wrote 2,000 years ago and apply it to our, our lives? How do we, as the people of God in 2024, how do we recover our lives? How do we find how do we find grace for our souls? And so I want to just give us three simple principles. And the first, first is this. If we're going to experience a healthy soul, then first, arrange your day. What do I mean arrange your day? Well, we see Jesus organizing his day. He's always sneaking out early before things happen. And the disciples are always looking for him. He's always stepping away in the middle of the day when things are crazy or stepping away at night and spending time with the Father. There's something beautiful about watching the pattern of Jesus of arranging his day so that he could spend time with the Father or find a time just to get away from the crowds or a time to laugh or a time to cry or a time to just process life. And well, Dallas Willard would say it this way. You must arrange your days so that you are experiencing deep contentment and joy and confidence in your everyday life with God. You must arrange your days so that you are experiencing deep contentment and joy and confidence in your everyday life with God. Now you're like, huh? But you don't understand. I got to work. I got to pick up the kids. I got to clean that. I got, I got all these things to do. And, and, and someone once told me this. It was, the, it was probably the most powerful, simple statement they ever made uh, that I ever thought about when it comes to my schedule. They said, Doug, you have time for what's important to you. And at first, I wanted to argue. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was true. 
you have time for what's important to you. If you really want to see if the Heat won last night and you want to see the box score and how many points Jimmy Butler scored, you'll, you'll figure that, you'll find a time in your day to check that out. If you're wondering how your stock portfolio is doing, no matter how busy you are, you're going to find a moment to figure out, did I make or lose money? There's that little game you like to play when you have a little moment. The social media feed to find out how all those people you're trying to impress that you don't really even know are doing and you find yourself losing 30 minutes. You have time for what's important to you. How do you arrange your day? So you're experiencing this care for your soul. What does it mean if I woke up a little early and sat outside and watched the sunrise every morning? What does it mean like to go for a walk and just pray as I reflect on my days? I look at the moon and the stars and the sky. What would it, what would it be to exercise. So my body was able to relieve the stress of the day. You know, there's this moment in Elijah's life where Elijah, he experiences this super high high. Uh, he watches God send fire from heaven. And, and like the next day he goes in this deep, deep depression. Like he goes from like high, high to low, low in less than 24 hours. And if you've ever experienced high, high to low, low, and you're like, how do I get out of that? You know what God says to Elijah? He says, you need to do two things. You need to take a nap and you need to eat something. <laughs> Literally, you can read it for yourself. God knew that Elijah didn't need to pray more or read more or preach more. He needed a nap and he needed something to eat. And <laughs> listen, some days the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Right? Jesus is taking a nap in the middle of a boat, in the middle of a storm, because he's tired. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to rest your body. Your, your soul is residing in your body. These, these things are connected. They're not separate. How do I arrange my days? You know, I was uh, talking with one of my son's coaches. He's a, he's a high jumper, and he's like, you know, I'd, I'd love to be an Olympian one day. And this coach was talking about Olympic athletes versus elite athletes, like this is another level. And he says, they both, they both work just as hard, but Olympic level athletes, they know how to rest and recover. What a powerful word, right? If you want to be elite, you work hard. If you want to be Olympic, you work hard and you rest well and you let your body recover. And there's something powerful about that idea. So how can I arrange my day? So I'm experiencing contentment and joy and confidence in my everyday life with God. Second thing, practice Sabbath. And the reason I use the word practice is because if you're going to create a 24 hour block of time where you don't do any work, that's going to take practice. Trust me, I've been practicing this for the last 35 years as a Christian because, well, I used to work on Sometimes Saturdays, sometimes Sundays, and then sometimes on Mondays. And, and I, I didn't really have a block of time. And so I've, I've worked really hard to try to figure out how, how do I create space where I'm not responding to emails and I'm not answering my phone. Dude, this is a really cool feature on phones. It's called voicemail. <laughs> and if your phone rings on Sabbath, it can just go to voicemail. I, I promise. It's like, a th it's like a, I don't know if it's new, but you don't have to answer your phone. There's a feature called Do Not Disturb. You can turn off all the messages, all the images, all the notifications, all the noise, and let your mind rest. And all of a sudden, you're going you're gonna to be like, and you're going to start seeing creativity flow. Because all those messages, all that, that noise, I mean, it's like this, this wealth of information that's created a poverty of attention, a poverty of, of, of creativity, a po poverty of of problem solving. Some people are so wrapped up in all the work and the noise and the emails and the texts and the responses and the notifications that, that they can't even work through a simple conflict or problem solve because they're so overwhelmed with all the stuff. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, says, come, come to me. I want to teach you because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you can find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Does that sound like a great invitation to you? That sounds like a great invitation to me. And so 
I've been practicing and failing for 35 years, but, but, but one of the things that I've, I've worked on is how do, I, how do I push away between Sunday afternoon to Monday afternoon, anything that feels like, like work for me? And how do I have fun? Like for me, Sabbath, I play basketball. Because when I play basketball, I'm working with my body, but I'm resting my mind. And there's something beautiful. I go to coffee with my wife and we just develop our friendship and talk about life. And there, there are moments you take a nap, go for a walk, listen to music. There, there's so many simple things you can do that are going to feel so unproductive. The point of Sabbath is to have an unproductive day and to be okay saying, while I'm not working, God is still reigning. While I'm not working, God is still providing. And he is a good God. And you sort of sit and cultivate that gratitude. Now, some of you might think, this sounds like a crazy person, but listen, this, these are not my words. These are Jesus' words. And he's invited us to something that most people in Western culture don't even understand the value of. But the reality is we live in the most anxious and depressed generation in the history of the world. I'm going to say that again. We live in the most anxious and depressed generation in the history of the world. You ever wonder why that is? It's all the stuff. It's all the noise, it's all the opportunities, it's all the things. And so Sabbath provides a relief from all of that. The book of Hebrews chapter four says this. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. There's this beautiful invitation to the people of God. Now, this, this is Christians. This is not the, the Jewish people before Christ. This is New Testament Christians, there is a Sabbath rest that God is offering you. If you don't resist, you can enter the Sabbath rest. And so the invitation goes out. But someone once told me on this journey as I was trying to figure out how to, how to find rest. They said, you know, if you can't rest, if you're unable to unplug, you're afraid of something. And every time... Someone challenges me like that. I'm like, I'm not afraid. <laughs> but if you can't rest, you should just follow that question. If you are unable to rest, you try, but you're like, oh, I just can't do it. Oh, I'm too busy. You're actually afraid of something. And then if you ask the question, what am I afraid of? And you follow it. Oh, I'm afraid that if I don't put in an extra day, I'll never achieve my goals. And people will never see me as the person that I, that I want to be seen as. And I want my kids to see me a certain way. I want the world to see me a certain way. And I, I want to be respected and I want to be loved. And that's why I work so hard. And that's why I can't rest because I can't let up on the accelerator. I, and you start to listen to yourself and you realize that sometimes those things that fuel you are the part that's unhealthy. And Jesus says, breathe, have an unproductive day, go for a walk, worship your God, read his word, and you will find rest for your souls. Church, I want to say practice, practice Sabbath. And then finally, retreat on purpose. There's a moment in a really busy season of Jesus' life in the middle of a lot of action. Mark chapter six, he says to his disciples, come away to a private place and rest with me. This is in the middle of an amazing outreach. Of explosive crowds are coming and, and he says, hey, I want you to come away and rest with me. And I wanna, I wanna give you like a picture into our, our pastoral leaders, all of our, past, uh, our campus pastors at all of our campuses. We did a retreat last week, a 48 hour retreat. And you know what we did? We, we spent time eating. We spent time on a lake. Spent time worshiping together, praying together and hanging out. We didn't really do any work for 48 hours. And it's amazing how God speaks in some of those down moments where you intentionally retreat. You retreat on purpose. God, we need to rest, we're tired. God, we need you to speak to us. We need you to bind our hearts together because we want to go together, not just for the next year, but for the next decade or as long as God gives us breath. And, and God spoke to us in a beautiful, powerful way because we retreated on purpose. So maybe you look at your 2024 calendar and you're like, when can I find a 24-hour, 48-hour, week-long process where I can sort of get away and, and retreat? Maybe a private retreat, maybe a retreat with your husband or wife, maybe, maybe even something with your kids, but something where you can get away from all the noise and turn everything at work over to someone else. And you're like, no, no, I, I could never do that. You could, 
if you retreated on purpose. And again, this is a powerful invitation. It's not just a daily thing or a once a week thing. It's a rhythm of every year. How can I find a process or way that I can just process all that happened to me this year? Because, you know, depression and is, is this accumulation for many people of unprocessed griefs. They go through life and they go so fast they can't stop, they can't think, they just keep on going. And retreat on purpose allows you to go, what have I been carrying here and here? And how do I release it to Jesus? And how do I allow his grace to help me to not just to process, but to heal, that my soul can be filled again? Where am I pushing past limits? Where am I numb? Where have I lost my creativity. My wife and I, for really all the, all the time we raised our kids, would take a week away from our kids every year. And we would always say, hey, mommy and I, we're going to go to work on our marriage. You're staying with grandma and grandpa, the babysitters. And, you know, that was a valuable week every year. Because I have, I have something I want to tell you guys. I don't know if you know this now, but your kids, they're all going to leave. And it's just going to be you and her. And if you're not friends, you've missed an opportunity to purposely retreat, to build your union. And there's always a reason not to. And so I want to close with this beautiful invitation from God. It's, you'll recognize it. It's Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. Jesus is the good shepherd. And if you follow him, he will help you recover your life. Can we thank him for his goodness and his grace and his love for us? And let's take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you for this very countercultural invitation that in all of our work, we can rest. And so, Jesus, help us to discover the easy yoke and to discover that spending time with you is the reward, that you have a way to help us reframe our disappointments and our losses. You help us to frame our achievements and our success all at the same time. You help us to love you and then love the people around us at deeper levels to get rid of all the junk we've been carrying, the burden. And you teach us the easy yoke. And so, Jesus, help us to find a way to practice Sabbath in new ways. Help us to find a way to retreat on purpose this year and get quiet. And Jesus, that as we arrange our life this way, we would experience this true rest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, before I say amen and before we close our service, Hebrews chapter four, where God says there's a Sabbath rest for his people. He also says this, there were people who refused to enter the Sabbath rest of God. And the reason they refused to enter is a lack of belief. He says, your unbelief. You see, the only way you can rest in the presence of God is to know that you're forgiven. To know that he's paid the price for your sin and that because of that ransom that was paid, you don't have to try to do more good than bad. And you don't have to try to live a perfect life because your heart is free. It's at rest. But he says there are a lot of people who never enter the rest of God. They try to figure it out themselves. I'm not going to give my life completely to God. I'm not going to repent of my sins. I'm going I'm to try to do more good than bad. I'm going to strive. I'm going to figure it out. And he says that those people, they, they don't enter the promised land. They don't enter heaven because of unbelief. But then he says that God has appointed a day he calls it the day of salvation. The day when a person goes from running their own life, trying to figure it all out themselves and living in this kind of like crazy zone to finally just surrendering and saying, okay, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I, I can't do this anymore. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to offer you my life and I'm ready to acknowledge that I'm a sinner and my sin has separated me from you and that I, I can't earn my way out of that. I can't deserve your grace. I just, I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. I'm here to repent. And I'm here to live the life that you have for me. This, this yielding. And the author of Hebrews says that day that God has picked is called today. That he's ordained a day in your life. 
and that day is called today, where you won't harden your heart, but you'll soften it. And for the first time in your life, you'll say, God, I I need your rest. I need that rest for my soul. I need the forgiveness of sin. And so here at Calvary, we have this this moment. We affectionately call it an altar call. We play a closing song and we, we say, if you want to start a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, you can do that here today. If you're ready to repent of your sins and and offer him your life, well, we're gonna play a closing song and we're gonna invite you, if if you're ready today to stand up, to walk forward and to pray a simple prayer at this platform. It's not a magic prayer. It's just a supernatural acknowledgement that you are a sinner and that you need a savior and he has come for you because he loves you. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He loves you. And this is a moment where his love can be lavished on you. This is a moment of grace. Grace means we can't earn this. We can't deserve this. We can only receive it as a gift. And so if you're ready to make that decision, to give your life to Jesus, and that today is your day, I'm gonna ask you right now to stand up and to walk this way, and we will celebrate with all of heaven as you come, if that's you. Come now. Hey, as you're watching online, maybe you're realizing how much your soul needs rest from all that's going on inside. Let me encourage you today. He is here to give rest to the weary. And if you've never accepted that ultimate rest that God has for you, the rest that comes from giving up your own striving to earn God's favor and accepting what He has done for you on the cross, then this can be the moment that changes everything for you. Even if you're watching online, you can pray a simple prayer in just a moment that will give your life to Jesus and to give him all your sin and all your shame, all your striving and failures, and he will forgive you and fill you with his Holy Spirit. So as we join Pastor Doug again, go ahead and pray that prayer. And afterwards, we'll give you some simple next steps to begin your new life in Jesus. We love you guys, and we're praying for you. celebrate your decision today and it's like we sang those words God I need you Lord I need you come on, come on. <laughs> listen if you're still in your seats and you're thinking like I should be up there we're not going to sing another song another chorus but we, we don't want you to miss this opportunity our heart is so quick to close off like you felt like and I need to make this decision, but your heart's so quick to get hard to go, I'll do this later. I have so many questions or I can't stand up in front of all these people. All those things that go through your mind in this moment. And all he says is today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. We don't want you to resist his love. So if you're still out there, we're gonna ask you to stand up and join this group. We'd love to pray for you tonight. loves you so much. For you that are here, I'm just going to ask you to repeat a simple prayer out loud after me. This is my words, but you can say this to God and he will hear your prayer. So say this out loud after me. Say this to God. Lord God, I open my heart and I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. Today I repent. Now fill me with your spirit and I will walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. Congratulations. Well, if you prayed that prayer right now, we Welcome just wanted to, to congratulate you so and celebrate you, you seats, and let you know that you made the best decision you've ever made in your life. So please let someone know in the chat or text BELIEVE to 31352 and then just follow the prompts so we can walk alongside you on this new journey of faith. 
Hey, what a great message today, right? Man, soul keeping is so important. Making time to rest in him is so important. We never want to end up doing anything for God without spending time with him first, getting his heart for us and getting his heart for people. So I love that about soul keeping and and making time for him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know I have some really great takeaways that I'm going to be writing down and reflecting on. And so we would just love to hear your takeaways as well. So if you haven't already, go ahead and share them in the chat. We want to know what they are. Yeah. And hey, just a recap, if you missed the beginning of our service, we are Calvary Music, and we simply exist to write songs for our church here at Calvary Chapel, and we've been playing a little bit of uh, our music behind the scenes, unplugged. Again, so if you want to hear more of our music, you can search for it on your favorite streaming platform, including looking out for a new release on May 3rd, mark your calendars. While you wait, I am so excited for this song. So we would love to close out this service with just one last song, and it is called Believe. Come find your healing beyond understanding. Come find forgiveness and love never ends. Of the Father are waiting to welcome you home. Come find redemption, new life is waiting. Come to the altar with no hesitation. The arms of the Father are waiting to welcome. Confess with my mouth, believe, believe, you're the Lord over all, Jesus right here, I believe, believe, I believe in my heart, I confess with my mouth, believe. right here right now I believe well thank you so much for tuning in we love you guys and we'll see you next week in person or online. Bye.